Turn with me to John 12. The next few weeks, we're going to be back in the Gospel of John. We've been slowly going through this book the last three years. And um, we have just taken a break for the summer, going through a series on the Psalms, how to pray the Psalms. But now we pick up where we left off, John 12, the Seeing Jesus series. So the small series, but a part of a much larger one. Now, as you're turning there, I have two pictures to show you. And these pictures help us to understand what John is trying to demonstrate in chapter 12 when he wants us to see Jesus. First off, a man from Colorado moved to Kansas, and he built a house with a large picture window in which he could see miles of rangeland, maybe something like that right there. The only problem this man from Colorado said is that there's absolutely nothing to see when he looks out that window. Look at the second picture. About the very same time, a man from Kansas moved to Colorado, and he built a house with large picture windows overlooking the Rockies. And he said, the only problem is, I can't see anything. The mountains are all in the way. Do you get the point of this? Perspective is everything, isn't it? No matter what's right in front of you, it's your perspective that changes what you see and how you see it. Even breathtaking, amazing, beautiful views like the ones you just saw. Now, today we begin, John 12, how we see Jesus. What is our perspective? And we're going to find Jesus in a house in John chapter 12. And so I've entitled this first message in the series, Seeing Jesus in the House or Maybe Even in Your House. And I want to say this today, the perspective of your heart will change the way you see Jesus. It's not about who Jesus is. The problem is not with Jesus. The problem is your perspective in how you see him. And in John 12, he's going to help us to see Jesus the way some people see him very wrongly in a very skewed way. And he's also going to help us to see him the right way from a heart that actually recognizes him for who he is. So if you will, John chapter 12, let's read together verses 1 through 11, and then we'll pray and ask the Lord's help as we study his word. John 12, beginning at verse 1. Scriptures say, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, was. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, the Greek says pure nard, pure oil, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragments of the oil. But one of the disciples his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who had betrayed Jesus, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away, and they believed in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, we come now. We come now, Lord, and we just want to offer a prayer of help. We come and we pray for us as a church first. Lord, hear our hearts. Speak into them. Feed them this morning as sheep in need of a shepherd, in need of green pastures, in need of still waters. Today, I pray you would pour into us. Oh God, be with those who are watching by live stream this morning. Be with those in this room today whose hearts are weak and are weary, who are thirsty, and they are in need 
of living water. Oh God, I ask now that we would see you for who you are. Jesus, that you would change us. Be with God, church members who can't be here today. I think of others that we haven't prayed for yet. I think of Laura Cobb this morning. Be with her, God. Encourage her heart. I pray, Lord, for those who do not know you, Christ, right now. God, the Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do what you could only do and awaken sinners to see you as Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. There's a lot of confusion in the Gospels about this particular account. And the reason why is the Gospels of Matthew and Mark both tell this very identical story. You find it in Matthew 26 and Mark chapter 14. However, the Gospel of Luke has a similar story, but what we believe is a different story. And I just want to point that out. In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50, we read about a woman who comes to Jesus, and she is called a sinner. And she comes, and she also anoints Jesus. But it's important to understand that account involves a different woman, a different place, a different reaction from Jesus, and at a very different time in Jesus' ministry. However, the accounts of Matthew and Mark are parallel to this. So if you're taking notes, you can read this in Matthew 26 and in Mark 14 as well. And you might see a few of those passages today as we go through on the screen as we try to put the story together and understand exactly what God wants us to see about Christ. Now, this chapter begins in John 12 with the word then or the word therefore. So John is connecting chapter 11 with chapter 12. And what he's saying here is that God is at work in all of the ordering of these events and the timing of how these things happen and why they happen, it all matters. It's all important. Those little connector words that we find in the Bible remind us that our lives are also all connected together, that God is providentially, he's working over every detail. One thing happens to lead to another thing, and God is at work in all of them. Some of them are very low in the valley. Some of them are on top of a mountain. Some of them are kind of lost in the middle, and we're not sure where we are, but God's providential hand is at work. So then, six days before the Passover, we are told, Jesus came to Bethany. So when we left off, Lazarus was miraculously resurrected. People were giving the glory to God. Their minds were blown away in chapter 11. But the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. They decided that he had become too famous. He had too much of a following. The people's hearts had turned towards him. And they wanted him gone. Yet it was not yet his time to die. So we are told that Jesus went to the wilderness of Judea. But now he returns to Bethany. Bethany was a village on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, about two miles going from the Jericho Road to Jerusalem. He's very close to the capital city, to the heartbed of his opposition, the religious leaders. Now, it's also important to note that this is just before the Passover, the last Passover. In other words, John is now taking us to the last week of Jesus' life. We enter the end, and yet there's a lot of chapters that focus on his last week and his last words. We've got a lot of great and compelling series to come in this book. That being said, when we get here to this spot, I want you to notice this is Jesus' last earthly Sabbath, his last week and his last day of rest. And who does he spend it with? What does he do? He spends it with Mary and Martha and Lazarus at Bethany. And I want you to notice here the power of fellowship and community. I want you to see when you read this passage that Jesus took time to spend with his followers. In fact, we could say it a very different way. Everything Jesus did was to invest in his followers, to the family that he was building on earth. You see, even at this most climactic moment as he's preparing to suffer the wrath of God on the cross, he does not despise or decline this meal and this fellowship. We read about Jesus often meeting and going in the homes of Pharisees and tax collectors and his followers. And this is a reminder here that we are never too busy to ignore the people of God that he has given us. In other words, there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian because we don't have a Lone Ranger Savior. He took time with his people because they needed him and we need each other. Now, 
not going to church and not fellowshipping, if you claim to be a Christian, because of all the hypocrites, is like saying, I'm not going to go to the gym because of all of the out-of-shape people that are there. All right, that's what some of you were just thinking. Well, pastor, you don't understand. It's some of the people I can't stand. I get it. You think Jesus thought all these people were perfect? In fact, if you go to a church and you go to a fellowship and you're expecting to find the perfect place, the minute you walk in the doors, you will have just ruined the church because it will not be perfect anymore. In fact, one writer said it this way. Sure, you can be a Christian and not go to church. Kind of like a zebra separated from his herd Getting eaten by cheetahs is still a zebra. Ouch, right? You say amen or you say ouch to that one, right? That's pretty tough. But the point here is Jesus valued the people of God. So just don't miss that on the onset. Now, also it's important to point out where Jesus is at, what house he's at. He's not at, he's not at Mary and Martha's house. He's not at Lazarus' house. It seems that way when you read John 12, but when you read Matthew 26 and you read Mark, you find out Jesus is at the home of a man named Simon the leper. Now, our assumption here is, of course, and it's a good assumption, Simon is not a leper anymore, or else he wouldn't be hanging out with people, right? He'd be outside of the city. He could not be here and have guests to entertain. So our assumption is that Jesus healed Simon the leper, and now they are throwing a meal because Jesus has entered town, and we see Lazarus here as the guest of honor with Jesus. And I want you to notice that Jesus values his time with the people of God. Now look, some of you are like, Pastor, that was all really uh, tough about valuing the people and the whole cheetah and zebra thing. That was a little rough. But I want you to understand something. This is really important. The church is an imperfect place. And it is full of imperfect people. But when we worship together, we are not worshiping imperfect people. Nor are we coming strictly for imperfect people, except for, first and foremost, yourself, who is an imperfect person, right? You're coming because you need what? Jesus Christ. You have a perfect Savior. The church is messy, and feelings are out there. In a good church, people's feelings are out there because we're honest with one another. We care about one another, but we also celebrate together. We have God stories of how God works, and uh, we have church members helping each other and blessing each other and being there for the hardest of days. The church is not perfect, but her Savior is, and that's why this is so important. And this is why Jesus invests in the church. He doesn't just invest in individuals, though he does, but the individuals collectively make up the church. He said, not I'm going to build up individuals that the gates of hell will not prevail against. He said, I will build my church. And he evidences that over and over in his life. Now, he is at Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, was raised. So now we're pointed back to this astounding sign and miracle of John chapter 11. Lazarus was dead. He had been in the ground for days. And now we see very clearly his resurrection was not a mere optical delusion. That the eyes of the bystanders had not been deceived by a ghost or a vision. He had a real material body. He's sitting at the table. He's eating and drinking real food. And by the way, all the proofs we have here of Lazarus, including the religious leaders so convinced of the miracle they want to kill Lazarus at the end, is also true of Jesus. Jesus showed up after his resurrection, just like Lazarus. This was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. He showed up literally and bodily. He was seen by his disciples, seen by his brothers, seen by his family, seen by crowds of 500 at once. Jesus had a literal body after his resurrection where he ate meal. We, we read him eat about him eating broiled fish with the disciples together, where Jesus physically, literally appeared. And so my point here is that just as we see the reality of the miracle, the raising of Lazarus, so we have even more evidence for the reality of the miracle of the raising of Jesus of Nazareth. And so one day we will also be raised if we know him. One day we will die. And if you are a Christian, you will not leave the land of the living to go to the land of the dying. You will leave the land of the dying to go to the land of the living. So this is a reality. The Bible is clear about these details to affirm our faith. We said it in the Apostles' Creed today. We believe in the resurrection, right? We believe this is a true doctrine. 
Now, in the next verses, we have varied reactions to Jesus in the house. People see Jesus differently. Some I'm going to spend a little time on, some I want to spend some more time on as we finish this message up. So first off, we see Martha with heartfelt service. Secondly, we see Mary with humble sacrifice. Third, we're going to see Judas with hypocritical self-interest. Fourth, we will see the religious leaders with hostility. And fifth, we will see the crowds with hope. And so that's where I want to go today. That's what I want to help you to see and why all of these five views of Christ matter in this home. So we begin. It's dinner time, verse 2. It's the main meal of the day. The Sanhedrin in John 11, the religious ruling body of Jerusalem, had decreed that if anyone sees Jesus, to report it so they can kill him. In fact, we are told in extra-biblical uh, Jewish documents that there was a reward on Jesus' head if you could get him dead or alive. Wanted Yeshua ha Nazari. Wanted Jesus of Nazareth. These were literal placards, signs that were posted because they wanted him turned in and killed. And yet what's amazing here is rather than turning him in like some criminal and having him arrested, Jesus' friends give him a supper, a dinner in his honor. We see first the devoted service of Martha. She could not sit still and do nothing when her Lord was present. You see, she is motivated by love in her heart. Now get this, please hear this. Much of Christianity today has, has really backwards the message of the gospel. They say, do, 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 and God will love you. In other words, it's about what you do to get God's love and favor and joy. But the message of the gospel is the very opposite. You can't do anything. Jesus did it all. And once you meant Jesus, you will not do it out of obligation or guilt you will serve him with joy and love because he's changed everything inside of you. Amen. So if you're not a Christian today and you're like, church attendance, reading the Bible, I get it. I understand why that might not be the most exciting thing. I get it. Been there, done that. But see, we're not supposed to do these things out of debt or out of obligation. Too many people try to please God out of debt and obligation. And the reality is you can't please God that way. There's only one person who pleased God on your behalf, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. So she begins to serve Jesus with loving gratitude. She wants to honor him. Why? Because he has changed her heart. She has saved her brother and resurrected him from the dead. Yes, this is the, the sister of Lazarus, and she begins to serve him. And so I want to say to you, if you've really seen Jesus... You will see him with heartfelt service. You're going to want to serve him. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said it this way. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Ouch. But when he says that, he doesn't just simply mean you have to go overseas. See, we're called to be on mission right where we live. Uh, if you live on Klondike Road, you're supposed to be on mission on Klondike Road. Right where you go to school. If you go to school in Beulah, you're supposed to be on mission in Beulah, students. See, yeah, we are called to go to the nations, but the nations are also right here. Your neighbor is right next to you. You can make a difference in this world right where you're at in serving him. It's not simply that everyone's called to preach from a pulpit, but everyone is called to preach with their words and actions. And so clearly here, every Christian is saved to serve. And this is consistent with what we've read about this dear lady, in other passages, in Luke 10, we read about Martha serving while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and learned. Just like light is made to shine, a Christian is supposed to act like Christ in serving others. That's exactly what we see here. By the way, this is following the example of Jesus. In fact, uh, Jesus in a few days is about to go wash feet, right? In Matthew 23, he said, the greatest among you will be a servant, will be your servant. In other words, the greatness in the church is not simply found in who preaches on Sunday morning. If you have that idea, you've gotten the church all backwards. Uh, the great servants of the church were here last night cutting the grass, and this morning we're getting grease splattered on them and had to run home and get another shirt. All right, the great servants of the church are the ones who go and pick somebody up who needs a ride. The great servants of the church are who on Monday morning live the same Jesus that they worshiped on Sunday morning. Those are the great servants. 
don't sell yourself short in what God can do in you, by you, and through you. But you got to know him for this to happen. See, when we read about the apostles, they don't describe themselves simply as apostles. What does Paul say? Every letter. Paul, a matter in your translation, a servant or a bondservant, literally a slave. It's the Greek word doulos. Paul, a servant, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing Peter says, and Jude says, and John says. We're, we are saved to serve like light is made to shine. That's clear here. Secondly, we see Mary in verse 3. Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. And all the essential oils people said amen, right? Sorry, had to do that. Just had to give you guys a shout out. I know you're here. And, and they anointed the feet of Jesus. They wiped, she wiped that day. She anointed the feet of Jesus. She wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Understand, this is not an uncommon practice in eastern countries. The heat is dry and it is hard. The ground is sandy and it is dry. Everyone wears sandals. Their feet are exposed. They are liable to scorching and dryness. Kind of like August in Pensacola, right? And attending to the feet was the work of the servant in the first century. So we see this humility and devotion. We read in the Bible about washing the saints' feet. In that culture, that was a wonderful and beautiful way to show hospitality and love to your guests. It was an act of love and service. Now, when we see Mary serving here, I want you to notice she has spikenard, the New King James says. Or in the Greek language, it's the word nard. It has the word, I think it's pistis, which is a, a Greek word for pure or faithful or genuine. And then it describes it as a nard. Now, spices and ointments in this time period were used as an investment. They were like, um, something more valuable even than cash. This was like uh, if you have a, a safe at your house and you've got some, I don't know, bonds in it or you've got stock somewhere or some. This is where you invested your money because these things were small and they're occupying of space, portable, and you can negotiate in an opening mar open market to purchase things with them. So they were very valuable. Now, nard was a fragrant oil. It was an aromatic herb that was grown in the high pasture land of the Himalayan mountains between Tibet and India. And it was extracted from the root of a plant, the spike of the plant, that's why it's called spike nard, and it was native to the mountains. And it would have to be carried for miles on camelback through different mountain passes. Perfumes were made from this. It was very costly because of the great distance that it would be imported from. And the fact that it's pure makes it even more valuable here. We're told here it was a pound of this. Matthew and Mark indicate that it was contained in a very expensive alabaster jar. And that Mary takes this jar and she literally breaks it open. This very costly perfume, ointment, oil, whatever it is. And she begins to lavish it on Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that why this might seem a little foreign to our modern ears. It would not be at all foreign to the ears of the first century. And this is uh, a statement that shows the love she had for her Lord and Savior. There was nothing too great or too good for Jesus. This epitomizes faith and unrestrained love. When she sees Jesus, she sees him as the most valuable thing anyone could have. And I want you to understand today, salvation is not about not going to hell and going to heaven. Salvation is about having Jesus Christ. Heaven would be hell without Jesus Christ there. If you just want to go to heaven uh, to have Sunday fun day 24-7, and you don't have Jesus in that story, that's not heaven. The gospel is not, all you need to do is just pray and you'll go to heaven. The gospel is, you need to be rescued by Jesus and he is more valuable than anything. Amen. And if you see him, you get it all. But you need him. He says, I'm the door, right? I'm the way. I am the good shepherd. It's not the things, it's the person that we need. So you read this here and she is just lavishly worshiping him. 
She, as a true child of God, has a new heart and new life and now has new actions. And she doesn't just want to serve him. She is worshiping him in this beautiful way. In fact, later on in verse 5, Judas is going to say this is worth a year's wages. This is a lot of money. This very expensive spike nerd that she pours on him. So much so, we see that John was a witness here. This is like only a witness could say this. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. If you're an essential oil person, there was no diffuser. This stuff was powerful and strong, okay? I mean, and John, he was a witness to this, and he just remembers, he recalls. You could smell it through the whole house. It was such a wonderful moment there. She lets her heart speak freely through this act. I can't help but when I read this, think of the book of James chapter 2, and about how as we have been freely given... And freely receive, so we should freely give. Look at James 2 in the screen, verse 14 to 17. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, What good is it, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, if someone says they have faith but they do not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? Notice what James says. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see, when Christ is a treasure and is valuable to you and is not simply a historical figure, a great teacher, or just your savior, but when he is really and truly your Lord, he impacts the way you give, the way you live, right? Now, all of a sudden, we see this truth here. It is not simply faith alone that saves in the sense of this. James is saying this. He's saying we are saved by faith alone, but true faith that saves is never found alone. In other words, if you really get Jesus, you get a lot more than just saying, I got Jesus. Everything changes in your life. You see a need, Jesus is with you, and you're going to want to meet that need. What would Jesus do? That's what the old expression was, right? Well, he would serve. Nothing would be off limits to helping someone in need. Nothing, because the mercy of God has touched your heart. You're going to want to give that mercy to touch others. That's what James is saying here. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never found alone. We find joy in serving him. And then notice what she does next. She wipes his feet with her hair. Now, the washing of the feet was a degrading task done by menial servants. What we're told from Matthew and Mark is that she starts, she breaks open this jar, she begins to anoint the head with Jesus, and she's very generous because she's been saved in a generous way. So now she serves in a generous way. And she starts to pour this jar so that it goes down onto the floor. And then, not worried about what anyone else thinks, I don't care if people call me crazy, she begins to wash his feet with her hair. Now, understand this. Jewish women in public in that day would never do this in a common place. This would be considered a shocking act to unbind your hair in public. But this shows her intense personal devotion to Jesus. Nothing immoral here at all. This is love from the heart. Just giving everything she has, all of her money, washing his feet, preparing him in a, in a statement of worship in this way. I want to say to you today that when you get Jesus, some people might think you got crazy. I remember when, when my grandfather became a Christian. He had grown up uh, an orphan, and he was very blessed. He went to kind of a, a liturgical Lutheran church, but um, in that day, the particular church he, he was at, that denomination was a very liberal one where the gospel was not found, sadly. Not true of all Lutheran churches. There's many that still stand and preach the gospel, as our church does, but this particular one did not. And he grew up kind of going through the motions, and <clears throat> his uh, partner, he was working for the Baltimore City Police Department. This is back uh, 60, 70 years. This is a long time ago, all right? And his partner is a Christian. And his partner begins to share the gospel with him. And it was, I mean, it's a great story. It was pretty uh, crazy how God worked. And eventually, my grandfather bowed the knee to Christ as Lord, and he was saved. Amen. And all he knew was to go back to his church and talk to the pastor about it. And he came with all this excitement and joy. And he was just, Jesus has changed my life. And the pastor said, you need to go see a psychologist. Something is wrong with you. He couldn't understand, but don't you believe in Jesus? 
And he talked about all the sins that had just changed. He had just, they had been broken in his life miraculously. Not everyone has that kind of a transformation. Some of us are slower. Some of us are faster. But we've been changed when Jesus comes in. And, and this pastor said, something's wrong up here. Something's wrong up here. Now, um, what a sad indictment on that kind of Christianity, right? But the reality is people might, when they see you serve and love, they might think that, ah, oh, it's just, you know what? They're just weak and they're using that religion as a crutch. Well, amen. My legs were broken. I couldn't come to Jesus. My mind was depraved. I didn't think of him rightly, but Jesus healed me. So now I can see him and follow him. Amen. I was weak and he is strong. And you know what they're going to say? Ah, it's just a fad. They're just going to go through it for a while. It's just a little crazy spurt in your life. And that's okay if they say that. You keep your eyes on Jesus. He's valuable. He's a life changer. He's an eternity changer. Keep your eyes on him. So look what happens in verse 4. Here's the religious Judas Iscariot. Notice the word but, by the way, in verse 4. Stark contrast between the selflessness and generosity of Mary and Martha and the selfishness of this man here. Verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. This is the second time we see Judas in the Gospel of John. The first time ever we hear him speak in the Gospels. And notice he objects strongly. He says, this was a waste of money. On one impulsive gesture, you wasted all of this money. How inconsiderate of Jesus and cruel towards Mary, right? Calvin, in his commentary here, says the usual practice in the first century was to anoint the head. And then he quotes uh, Pliny, who was a Roman scientist and historian. And he says, Pliny said that it was considered an excessive luxury to anoint the ankles, the feet. Usually they just wash them. That's what a slave or servant would do. They would not anoint them with oil because no one's down there smelling, right? They would just anoint the head. But this is, this is very extravagant and excessive because Jesus is worthy and it's like Psalm 23, you anoint my head with oil, right? But no one anoints the feet with oil. It's too expensive. It's too valuable. Now, we must mention that when Judas says this, according to Matthew and Mark, the other disciples chime in. They agree with Judas. You see how one bag egg, egg can make the rest of the eggs rotten? All of a sudden, they all start complaining too. Maybe they scowl. Maybe they gesture. Some of them speak up. This was a waste. This was not right. This was too much, too far. So... So, so overboard. We could have used that money for better things. Now, John the Apostle unmasks Judas as hypocritical, as a liar here, does he not? Now, think about what has happened. And I want you to know that, that Jesus was not taken by surprise. He speaks right back. He defends his child to Judas. And we'll get to that in a minute. But I want you to understand that Jesus was not taken by surprise by this. He already said back in John chapter 6, one of you is a devil. He knew exactly what was going on in Judas's heart. So let's try to step back for a minute and assume what Judas is thinking, because I think this sounds like a lot of Americans in 2017. So this is what happens. Judas follows Jesus, and he says to himself this. He says, I'm going to cast a lot with Jesus, because Jesus is going to usher in a political kingdom. And if I follow Jesus, he is going to overthrow the Romans... He is going to be an exalted leader in this new nation of Israel, this new political kingdom. We're going to take back Israel, and Jesus is going to lead the way. And this dream is going to be so great that I'm going to get to sit as one of his inner cabinet, right? My hope is in Jesus. He's going to, he's going to deliver us from the taxation of the Romans. This is what Judas was thinking. But over time, Jesus didn't talk about a political kingdom. He talked about a spiritual kingdom. Jesus wasn't worried about money. He was worried about hearts. Jesus didn't simply try to purchase property. Instead, Jesus served the pain of the people. And he cared about them and had compassion. His kingdom was not one of force. It was one of love. And now the Jewish leaders, the ones who he thought would join with Jesus, they are disillusioned. They want to kill Jesus. 
And Judas is saying to himself at this minute, three years of my life I've wasted on this Jesus. And, and he's been the treasure and he's been stealing money. And now all this money that he could have got his hands on, that he thought he rightly deserved because Jesus had let him down, has just literally been anointed away in one moment. He is angry and he is infuriated. I want to read to you the words that are on the screen of the great German Protestant reformer, Johannes Eklumpadius. He said these words, The more wicked and graceless people are, hear this, the more ready they are to find fault with and blame others and see no beauty in what they do. Think about that. You know someone in your life, they're a negative Nelly. Just constantly, sorry if anyone's named Nelly in the room. Sorry about that. Just a figure of speech. They are constantly, constantly just a curmudgeon. They are just belittling and downing and hurting and castigating. And they see nothing good in what you do and how you serve or in how someone else serves and loves. All they see is the negative and they find fault and they blame. The reason why is because of the condition of their heart. See, we get angry at people like that a lot, don't we? We want to we give them what they deserve because they hurt me. They hurt my soul. They hurt my feelings. But the reality is they're a hurting person. That's why they hurt others. Their heart is dark. And we see this here in Judas. And notice his objection seems plausible, but it's very superficial. He says here, this could have been sold and given to the poor. The selfish person cannot understand the unselfish person. He says this is unjustifiable extravagance. You see, he's putting a false scenario out there. He's saying there's only one way you can serve God. Now, we're going to talk about the poor in a minute. Our church believes in serving the poor. We put money where our mouth is in serving the poor. We put our time where our mouth is in serving the poor. We're not making light of this. Neither is Jesus. But Judas is misusing something good for his own pocket. He's saying this could have been used to sell to the poor. You see, Judas was successfully hiding the darkness of his heart from everyone except Jesus. What a reminder that religious facades can hide secret sins. He says this could have been sold for 300 denarii. A denarii was a day's wages. This is a whole year's workload. But just remember, while this sounds really spiritual, the reality is G Judas is going to go next. And he's going to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It's not money. It's not the poor that he cares about. It's money. Whatever money he can get. He said this, verse 6, not because he cared for the poor. His greed masquerades as piety, as devotion. But it's not. He represents cold, calculated, cynical responses to Jesus. This is the person who says, I will never give money to benefit local ministry. We must first give our money to the nations only. This is the person who says, I will never pay for a missionary overseas. We must first send missionaries here at home. This is the person who says, we must first relieve poverty before we can preach the gospel. We must first feed bodies before we can tell others about Jesus. This is the person who says, I don't like the way the church spends the money, so I'm not giving any money. I don't like the new staff they hired. I'm not serving there. Let me explain something to you, brothers and sisters. When people like Judas say these things, the issue is not what they're talking about. The issue is the heart. You see, all of these things are important. Some of us are more called to do international missions. Some of us are more called to do local missions. Some of us are more called to feed someone who's hungry. Some of us are more called to preach the gospel with our words. We all have different giftings. But in God's kingdom, every single one of these things matters. The way you parent and grandparent is a ministry. It matters. The way you help your neighbor out in a time of need matters. The way you help the church and our outreaches matters. And we're all used by God in different ways, shapes, and form. And they all matter. There is no dividing line. You have to do ministry my way or you're not doing ministry. That is baloney. It's not right. And, and that's what Judas is doing here. And I want to say to you today, if you have any of those complaints, I'll just quote the great D.L. Moody. I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it, so we're going to keep doing it, okay? We're just going to keep doing it. And you can choose to follow Jesus or not follow Jesus. Now, if you have suggestions, look, we are a family here, right? 
So if you have suggestions, we say this at every membership meeting. If God has called you to a ministry and we aren't doing it yet, we want to know. Because we want to get on board with what God's calling you to. We don't have a monopoly on it either, do we? There's other churches that are great in Pensacola doing great work and we want to support them and help them and pray for them and love them. There ain't no monopoly on the ministry, is there? God's DNA to us all uniquely and differently to serve. The point is not what we're doing, what he's called us to. The point is that we're doing it and we're following him. Now we're told about Judas. He was a thief, an undiscovered thief. Only Jesus knew. And what a reminder that the root of money is the root of all, that money is the root of all kinds of evil, 1 Timothy. So if our affections are more on things than the giver of things, this can lead us into a very dangerous place. Now, look at the contrast here between Judas and Mary. It could not be bolder. Mary reclines at Jesus' feet in adoring love, offering extravagant worship, anointing him for his burial. Judas is condescending. He's arrogant. He is judging. He is judging Jesus' acceptance of the gift. He is judging her motivation and her process. One is a worshiper. One is a thief. One gives sacrificial honor. The other seeks personal gain. One demonstrates the way of grace. One the way of sin. Yet both look like they are with Jesus and with his people. They're both in the same house. One is a wheat. One is tares. One is a sheep. One is a goat. Do you hear what I'm saying? Again, Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a parking lot makes you a car. We can be in the same house watching the same thing and see two totally different things mattering the perspective of our hearts. It's the heart. Listen to what J.C. Ryle said here. There are few greater imposters in the world than some of those pretending, pretending to perpetually care about the poor. The truest and best friends of the working classes and the poor are the people who give most and do most for them. They will always be found among those who do most for Christ. It is the successors of Mary of Bethany and not Judas Iscariot who really care for the poor. They do not talk about it. While others talk and profess, they act out on it. What did James say? It's one thing to say, I'm going to pray for you if you're in need. It's another thing to go do it. This is how we serve. We put our faith into action. Now, back to Judas for one more minute, because we've got to wrap this up. We're just about done. This unhappy man will be a lasting proof of the depth of human corruption and sin. That anyone could follow Jesus as a disciple for three years, preach messages of the gospel, work miracles, see all his miracles, hear all his teachings, receive at his hand repeated kindness, be counted as an apostle by the co-workers. Even preach the message of the kingdom. And at the end, when his heart is finally exposed, prove rotten, seems almost impossible. But here's the point. Privilege alone converts nobody. If apostleship and miracles did not make Judas a Christian, neither will your office in the church, your good works in the church, or your position in the church. See Judas and see the full extent of human depravity. We believe in total depravity. That we, as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, when we get to it, the heart is deceitful, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God says, I search the heart. You can fool everyone in this room. You can fool your pastor. You can fool the person sitting next to you, your spouse, your family. But you cannot fool God. He sees the deepest core of of your heart. Heart is wicked on its own. Ephesians 2, we read it this morning, says it this way. It's why we read it. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what can dead men and women do? Nothing but stink, right? They can do no work for God. They cannot run towards God. They cannot respond to God. They cannot respond to the gospel. They cannot do anything good for God on their own. They are dead in their sins. There's nothing you can do to change your heart. There's no work you can do, no prayer you can pray. There's no church you can join that's going to make everything better for you. We are dead in our sins, and Judas is a clear example of our total depravity. It is not what we do. It is not the strength of our faith. It is the object of our faith. It is what Jesus has done by the power of Holy Spirit alone that rescues us from our sins. 
We are called to call on Jesus to repent and turn from our sins. And we do this because the Holy Spirit is at work. Because God has given us eyes to see him. Like Mary and Martha see him, not as Lazarus see him. Please, professor of Christ, hear me out. Jesus said in the first sermon he preached, Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. People will say, I've done great miracles. I've done mighty works in your name. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Judas needed a new heart. Everything looked good on the outside, but his heart had never been surrendered to Christ. He needed the salvation of Christ, not the works on the outside to be changed. Now notice here also, Christ will allow his money to be taken from him, but Jesus will never allow his sheep to be taken from him. You see that? He doesn't care about the money. He doesn't defend the money. He compares his sheep Look at verse 7. But Jesus said, as Mary is being criticized by all, Jesus comes to the rescue of his sheep, and he says, not let her money alone, let her perfume or oil alone. No, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. This woman was the best listener Jesus ever had. She was always at the feet of Jesus listening. She knew his death was coming. Now you say, Pastor, did she know that he was going to die this week? I don't know if she knew that. But here's the thing, when we serve God, it is often the case, we don't find out the full meaning of what we do and how God will use our labor of love on this earth, but we will find out one day. And so this was a preparation. As people are excessive at a burial, spend a lot of money for a funeral, you can't help but do it in America. In the same way, she was preparing him for his burial. And I want to say today, while Mary might not have understood the significance of her work, and while we might not know how God uses us when we go serve at the Waterfront Mission, or when we partner with the school, or we go help a church family out, or someone who's not a member of our church out, and we serve them and we love them, or we cook a meal for someone in need, or we pray for someone who's sick or someone who's hurting, we might never know, but when we get to heaven one day, we'll be able to see not just the trees in front of us, we'll see the forest of what God did. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. Now, Jesus says, the poor you have always with me, but you do not always have me with you. So Judas now stands at the crossroads. He's been unmasked as a hypocrite. He can fall before Jesus in humble repentance. He can confess his sins. He can find forgiveness at the cross. Or he can let pride harden his heart. He can refuse to repent. He can stay dead in his sins surrendering to Satan's influence and betray the Lord. Mark tells us what Judas does next. Mark 14, 10 and 11. Then Judas, who is one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Some of you could walk out of this church today and do the very same thing. You've heard how great Jesus is, how worthy he is, and you could walk out of here and betray what you've heard. Or you can love him and serve him and turn to him. Look how this ends in verses 9 through 11. I know I'm out of time because we're going to take the Lord's table together. What a glorious thing. But just hear how this ends. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. In other words, word spread. Lazarus is alive. He's in Bethany. He's eating a meal. And Jesus is there. The one who raised him. The miracle worker is there and the miracle's there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So, now we have another player in this story. The religious leaders, the chief priests, mainly made up of the Sadducees. What do they do? They make plans. They resolve to murder not only Jesus, but now they're going to murder the great witness of the miracle. You see, these men, men are ruthless in their rebellion against God. What it, Jesus said is true. If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, 
Neither will they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. What hostility. If you have hatred and hostility in your heart, it will produce irrational action on the outside. You see, knowledge of the Bible alone does not save. The Sadducees, the chief priests we read about here, they knew the Bible. And they denied the resurrection. And they had living proof that they taught the Bible wrongly, that Jesus does raise dead people. Jesus does save those who are dead and give them new life. And one day he will give them a new body. They had proof in front of him. And rather than repent, they chose to put him to death and put the witness to death. How dangerous hatred and an unsaved heart really is. But notice verse 11. The Jews believed. Many of these Jewish men and women and children believed on Jesus. And John says this here because he wants you who are reading this to do the same. To turn from your sins. And right now you're being offered the chance to believe on Jesus Christ. Right now, as he raised a dead man in Lazarus and he saved crowds of people who were desperate for salvation, right now, he can save you. I want you to notice that the threat of the religious leaders did not stop people from being changed by Jesus. Prisons and threats and penalties cannot stop the working of the Holy Spirit in a heart. Tyrants can burn Bibles, burn martyrs, silence preachers, but they cannot stop the work of God. How do you see Jesus in this house today? Some loved him and served him. Some were indifferent towards him. Some hated and opposed him. But thank God some believed on him. And they were changed forever. And today, the Bible says this is so clear and so simple. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. May we bow our heads and our hearts before we take the Lord's table.